Hello and welcome to this post uh, budget analysis of the uh, very first uh, budget that uh, Finance Minister Melusi Gigaba has delivered in his capacity still as a Finance Minister for, Minister for 2018. I mean, the Minister took a jibe at all the uh, speculation about how much time he had in the uh, ministry. Uh, a bit ambiguous, but he did start off saying or asking uh, President Ramaphosa, how much time do I have? Of course, we don't know if he was referring uh, to the actual time to deliver this speech or the actual time in a cabinet that one remains to be seen but let's get straight to it he announced a lot of things that will affect a lot of lives here in South Africa helping us uh, navigate through exactly what we need to know about uh, budget 2018 is Lucia Tongwane who is EY Africa tax leader Tendani Manchinguli who is the CFO group IT finance at Liberty and Tim Namo founder at Ironhead trading I, I, I suppose perhaps Perhaps if we just begin with a general uh, uh, um, sort of view, a sort of a new general interpretation of the budget, I mean the tone, the things that he said, were you impressed? Tindani, let me begin with you. I think I was with the boldness at least of them raising VAT, understanding that the economy is in trouble and then we've exhausted all other revenue. Um, streams that we can think of of raising taxes. The fact that he didn't do go the populist route of going to the few percentage points up in the in the income scale of raising the marginal tax more than 45 percent and raising tax, I think that was pretty bold. I am I differ a bit with the minister in the sense that the projections of the deficit are very dependent on whether the economy grows. And if, from what he said, that uh, the economy, uh, economic outlook improved significantly last year from mainly the agricultural sector, the primary sector of the economy, you don't want growth that is based primarily on agriculture. You can imagine what that's going to do in the Western Cape this first quarter of 2017, uh, as for 2018, going to throughout 2018. And if we miss out on the projected growth rate, we're going to miss out on the deficit projections. That's my worry. <laughs> For sure. And Lucia, I mean, the minister saying that this speech was a lot better than what he delivered in October. Do you agree? Yeah, I actually agree because in October, I just felt that he is so lightweight, like there was nothing really that was of substance. He touched on just so many things and you started asking yourself, what are you about? You know, we, we need to understand because that's the time when we were talking about the deficit is about 50 billion you know, that SARS is not going to cover as we did the forecast, and that is not changing. So I felt that we needed more, although we know that uh, the October speech is about just giving us some indications, but I still felt that they were very weak. When you compare to today, I think they've done some work. There's work that went into this. There was some boldness, as Tandani says, that went into this, because remember, we have been saying, we, let's just face it, we need to increase VET. But then the political view, you know, the poor and all of those things, trade unions. So you start saying, um, are they going to continue and be worried about be being popular, you know, and making sure that, you know, all this noise that is going on about you can't increase bad, it will affect the poor and all of those things, where they're going to toe the line. But I feel that they've been very bold, like you say, you know. I wanted 2%, obviously, and I know I'm very unpopular about this. But then for me, it was we need to plug that hole yeah. because we can't look at that, like at SARS deficit in isolation. We have to think about the national debt. Mm -hmm. At what stage do we touch that? Because remember, the interest only on our national debt is like so huge. So we need to start doing things that actually show that we are serious about this. And I think he has touched on that. I'm glad he didn't mm. speak with you because 2% increase on that. Oh, wow. I don't know how I would have stomached that. <laughs> but anyway, Tim, let's bring you in here. We're seeing the RAND strengthen. Uh, is it because it's happy with the budget that Gigaba has just delivered? Um, I suppose it didn't weaken on the uh, on the increase in the VAT rate. I think a lot of people had uh, priced that in, and um, I, th yeah, I suppose overall it was it was a reasonable budget. I see that they've uh, made a commitment to do the uh, university education, but phasing it in, which I suppose is a subtle way of handling it. And um, and yeah, uh, you know the momentum from the political changes over the last few weeks have have carried on, and. Um, 
well, we'll see whether we, we have another retest of the 1155 level. Okay, so let's break this down. So uh, the budget deficit at around 48 billion rands, and he says that the uh, VAT increase is going up by 1%, which I understand will bring it around 20, 20 or 20, 22, 22 so billion yeah, rands. Yeah. So now how is that going to work for me? So 1% increase in VAT now, next time I go into a mall, uh, or what does that mean? So I think it means for you going to the mall from April, um, you're going to pay more because all prices are going to go up by that. And, uh, and there's going to, as to say, it's going to bring uh, a bit more into the fiscus. He does talk about, he emphasized the fact that uh, the zero rated goods for the lower income spectrum is going to remain the same. That is going to provide a cushion for those people who are dependent on maize, bread, and various zero rated goods. However, <coughs> he also went on to talk about the fact that uh, the social grants increase by more than inflation, which is fine in rent terms, though that's not a lot. The, that assumes that the cushion is going to be, um, you cushion the vet, but the input cost that goes into the production of bread, the production of maize, is dependent on other things other than vet. So the price of bread and the price of maize is not only dependent on vet. Good news is that I think in the maize production part of the producing part of the country, it is raining, so I don't think you're going to have a problem there. But if you look at other parts of the country where you produce maize and so forth, I mean wheat and so forth, you might find that the input cost might go up. So I think it's a bit misleading to say that zero rated goods will never go up. That depends on input costs as well. But I mean, if, if you take that away, yes, indeed, if you zero rate, the, the lower income spend, um, spectrum is not going to suffer, but it, it, it leaves out the input cost. I'm just worried because of the drought. All right, okay. We actually do have uh, Johan Els, who is the head of economic research at Old Mutual, uh, joining us on the line for his insights. Johan, your impressions of Gigaba's first budget? I think a pleasant surprise, especially after that horrific uh, medium-term budget policy statement in October last year, when they totally went against fiscal consolidation, but of course they saw the light and I, as I said, a pleasant surprise when they returned to fiscal consolidation um, this afternoon. A pleasant surprise, did anything or was there anything that you thought he could have done more of or that you weren't too impressed by? No, actual fact, um, you know, I was skeptical before the budget because the, the, there was room for them to significantly reduce the budget deficit. They went for the middle way in terms of um, reducing the deficit, reducing the debt burden, burden quite substantially, but also not hurting the economy too much. So we're in this phase where we expect better economic growth this year, um, and they could have heard that, but they didn't. The VAT increase was, of course, the nuclear option by spreading the tax burden quite a bit more than just targeting the top marginal income group. Um, that means less pain for the overall economy. So the VAT rate increase also means that they showed that they're serious about fiscal consolidation, taking the difficult option, um, and that positively, in my mind, reduces the risk of a Moody's ratings downgrade quite substantially. Uh, Johan, just stay on the line there for me, uh, and we'll come back to you uh, just to get some insights from the other voices that do join us in the studio. I mean, Tendani, you were questioning the whole zero-rated uh, basket of goods and whether, you know, the poor would actually be shielded as a result of this increase in the uh, VAT rate. Uh, was this a, a poor-friendly uh, budget? Um, to some extent, yes. But then there are still consequences for the poor, I think, if you look at it, because we didn't really adjust a lot in terms of uh, personal income tax. Those buckets haven't changed a lot. So you will have that bucket creep. And we didn't adjust for inflation. So because we didn't adjust for inflation, we are going to get them affected. Like, you know, the 300 to 500 um, bracket, I think they are going to get some pain. Mm -hmm. and, and the, the other thing, the yeah. other thing for me is that, remember that they are going to pay VAT on electricity, for instance. Mm -hmm. So they are going to be affected. Mm -hmm. 
So we will we'll say bread, you can still get eggs, you can still get milk, you can still get fruits and vegetables, you can still get, but they are going to be affected. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but it was a necessary evil. It was a necessary. I, I mean, he so. said that. I mean, mm. ultimately, uh, you know, let's take some pain now mm. for the ultimate improvement of the economy going forward. Yes. Uh, Tim, how do you think the the market or the investors will take this budget? Um, as the commentator mentioned earlier, due to the tone, uh, I suppose we, we're less likely to, a little bit less likely to see a, a, a budget. Def uh, sorry, a, a ratings downgrade. Um, you know the rand the rand has held quite steady. I think the the only real issue with the rand is more that it appreciated um, sort of before the um, uh, before Cyril Ramaphosa became president. So we're looking more at a situation now where the uh, rand is more likely to become, or there's risk that the rand becomes more overvalued going forward, or we're at a position where technically uh, we're more likely to weaken. Uh, you know, sort of going forward into the in, in, into the next year, uh, over the next year, um, because the levels, for example, the levels that we saw recently last week, I'd only really been expecting to see from sort of June, July, uh, but obviously with the the change in the the, the political environment, there'd been that um, uh, there'd been that positive flow of, um, of of dollars coming in, and like the the minister mentioned at the beginning of his speech, that you know he felt that it's a it's a good basis for um, uh, for, for for us to build on. Uh, for sure. Johan, perhaps if I get your insights on the downgrade as well, do you also think that this budget has helped us avo avert a triple a downgrade there uh, with Moody's, the last one to have us on investment grade? Yes, I, I certainly think so. With the balance between uh, fiscal consolidation, so lower deficit and debt ratio improving and stabilizing, um, that is a positive for Moody's, but it's also positive for them that the budget won't hurt the economy too much. And that was a crucial factor for them, because if the economy is growing at too slow a pace, then the ability of government to achieve their deficit target is limited. So for Moody's, I think this would be a fairly good budget, and I certainly do think that um, they will be willing not to downgrade us yet. And of course, these ratings agencies always take a um, watch and see approach and see how things pan out over time. But certainly, I think the improvement in confidence is going to help the economy this year. So strong economic growth, room for the Reserve Bank to cut rates from March onwards. Plus also, you know, if I can come back to the VAT issue briefly, um, a full 38% of the VAT of the CPI basket is not um, subject to VAT. That means that the impact is fairly limited, even though, yes, I admit the poor will have to pay a little bit more. But if you take a simple example, a product worth 100 rand, including VAT at 14%, with that at 15%, that extra 1% is only 88 cents. So it goes up from 100 rand to 100 rand and 88 cents. So it is a fairly limited impact compared to um, significant fuel levy hikes or other taxes that could have increased substantially more. So the VAT is spread far more widely than if we look at what the fuel levy would have had to increase. And with the poor far more exposed to transport costs than the, the overall CPI basket. I think it's a, it's a good budget from that sense, yes. I mean, so you spoke about growth earlier on. He said that you know last year's growth was being driven by the recovery in, in, in commodity uh, prices now that we had emerged from the drought. But he did also project pretty nice growth for this year, 1.5% in 2018, 2.1% in, 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 in 2021. I mean, what, what, what's driving that? For me, uh, what, what, what I would agree with in terms of that is I think business confidence would have increased significantly in the f last uh, few weeks. The developments in the last few weeks would have pushed business confidence up and also consumer confidence. And if business is confident about the future of this, this economy going forward, you're going to see them unlocking. You know, they've been accused in the past of sitting on savings because the policy uncertainty makes you not willing to invest. So if we see an increase in fixed investment expenditure by the private sector, you are going to see the economy growing. The president actually men mentioned specifics in the budget speech. I am going to convene an investor um, conference, I think in the second half of the year. I am going to get the partnership between labor, government and the private sector going. That makes sure that um, 
the companies feel confident in, in, in investing and therefore uh, investing and growing the economy. What he also did mention when he talked about education, I think you, are, you, you might talk about that later. He said that we are investing in education so that kids can, uh, those disadvantaged kids, can get a university education and we fight unemployment. You fight unemployment by increasing economic growth, not just by investing in education because then you have those kids graduating and the labor, the, the economy unable to absorb them into the economy. So going forward, I think just by business confidence increasing, I do agree that we're going to see. I mean, which is what has happened now. We've yes. got a lot of young people who are sitting at home unable to get a with job. A degree. Right, with a degree, yes. because business confidence is so low. But before we get to that education funding model, let's actually take a step back and look at one of the, 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 the things that uh, uh, Gigaba announced to fund that education. So the higher estate uh, duty tax rate of 25% for houses greater than 30 million rand. I suppose that's fair, right? Yeah, that is fair, because now it comes back to wealth tax. So in a way, it is part of wealth tax. And I think it's needed. If you think about it, if you or if you owning like about 30 million of some property, why shouldn't we take more from you mm -hmm. in the bigger scheme of things? Mm -hmm. But yeah. obviously, that's it's going into uh, education and saying, yeah. OK, it's only for first year students. And I suppose it's a positive thing also that it's being phased in. Mm -hmm. It's not yes. just you know a blanket approach. Everybody gets free high education. Th that's correct. But we shouldn't be be fooled as well. We must remember that maybe we have about 100 people who can actually afford that 30 million we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it is 25% increase because remember it, it moves from 20 because we had 20% as a flat rate, mm -hmm. you know, for property above 3.5 million. Mm -hmm. So now we are saying if it's 30 million, we're going to 25%. But how many people have that 30 million? I so it's it. not like it's going to bring in just so much more. No, for sure. I mean, it's, um, I mean, just to bring you back in here, uh, do you expect increased inflows into the South African market, particularly the bond market, as a result of this budget? Um, I think um, a lot of the, the the bond trade has already come through with the with the strengthening of the currency. I think it, it's it's more in a question of. Um, sustained flow. So there's no major reason for there to be a sudden outflow given the current environment. Um, so I think from the, the, the pickup that we saw that would have come in when uh, the, when, when the currency appreciated, um, the, those sort of levels of bond holdings would, uh, would, would more likely stay stable than there being a, a sudden jump, I think. And because you... Because it's largely because of an issue of the, of, of the currency. You, you have the issue, the issue of the currency working against you because we're not too far away from, you know, breaking 11.50, then 11, and then by the time we're at 10, we're overvalued. No, for sure. And Johan, I mean, in terms of this uh, budget, we've just touched on the issue of uh, private sector investment being essentially on ice uh, for quite a few years as the economy, you know, slowed to nothing. Do you see this turning? Yes, actually, I do. And I think that will be the big surprise for the economy um, this year into next year. Um, we saw a significant surge in private sector fixed investment after the 1994 um, elections. Um, as you say, it's been moving roughly sideways over the last few years and because of a slow economy, but also because of the impact of low business and consumer confidence. I certainly think with the lift in confidence that we expect to see, and certainly um, within the budget, uh, I saw lots of comments in terms of um, following up on the president's State of the Nation address in terms of trying to boost confidence, doing the right thing for investors. Um, so lots of confidence boosting measures. And I certainly think that will lead to stronger economic growth. Incidentally, I think the minister's 1.5% growth for this year is fairly conservative. I think we can easily see 1.8 to, to 2% GDP growth this year, lifting a little bit further into next year. And that type of growth, that type of consumer spending, that confidence boost can certainly boost private sector fixed investment. So businesses willing to once again um, go out and buy new machinery and equipment, employ more workers, building more factories, etc. So certainly that will be the surprise in the economy going forward. 
1.8% Johan, don't get our hopes up too high uh, there with those uh, projections. But of course, uh, the minister did also make reference to Old Mutual, welcoming your return back to the uh, JSC, your primary listing there. Your comments on the kind words from the minister. Yeah, we're very happy with that, um, of course. Um, and we talked to um, the budget competition um, candidates yesterday in terms of the adjudication and uh, I must say what I pick up from everybody is lots more confidence, lots more optimism over the last few weeks and that will spill through into the economy because we as consumers, we're driving this economy, the individual out there and as I said earlier, um, the budget tax increases won't be that negative in terms of consumer spending. The positives, I think, outweigh the negatives and the positives are, of course, very low inflation. Inflation can drop below 4% over the next few months. Um, strong RAND, that boosts confidence. And also if interest rates do cut, come through and we expect rate cuts from March onwards and we expect three rate cuts this year, all of that will help consumers. Um, and, you know, we've still got wage and salary increases above inflation. We've still got um, job growth and I think job growth will actually pick up with the economy and yeah I'm fairly confident about the 1.8 percent maybe plus um, GDP <laughs> growth for this year coming from consumer spending but also coming from fixed investment and some inventory built um, uh, with better confidence um, inventories will start to be built up again that means more production in the economy well, Johan, uh, thank you so much uh, there uh, for your time and leaving us with, uh, you know, that uh, room to be a lot more optimistic about our economy there. That was Johan Als, who's Head of Economic Research at Old Mutual. Uh, let's bring it back to the, um, this, 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 this budget. He touched on the fact that, all right, you're increasing taxes. But the thing is, tax morality here in South Africa is very low. I mean, the issue of tax morality for you, Tendani, well, I think people always find ways to work around the, the, the tax and I mean, Lucia will tell us more about that, but I, tax morality I think is an issue and the minister specifically mentioned that in the, in, the, in the budget speech, which I think is encouraging for me. For the first time, I really think, uh, for the first time in a long time, I really think that these are not just words. We have seen what has already happened. Um, decisive steps being taken by government to correct things that people have been saying are not going well for this for the longest time uh, what happened is at, at ESCOM for instance mm -hmm. the fact that they are specifically saying that they're going to look at that and try to close as many loopholes as possible I think that's encouraging for us because part of um, the reason why uh, SARS is not successful is that people do evade tax and mm -hmm. and I think for me, if we get away from that and there's something done, we're going to see government funds increasing. And of course, what's more important is not just that the revenue is collected and is generated, how do you spend it? Mm -hmm. You do get departments that have underspent and they have not delivered on, on I mean, the service delivery suffers as a result. So it's not only dealing tax morality, it's dealing service delivery mm -hmm. and getting the right people to do the right job in government departments from both national to local. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lucia, I mean, uh, on, on the issue of, of tax morality too, you, uh, there was a, an announcement of an increase in personal income tax brackets, uh, right? With some relief for some lower income tax uh, brackets. Did, did he give the actual percentage? I'm just trying to understand. No, I didn't see it. Right. I didn't see it at all. But I think what you are raising is actually very, very important because we have always talked about that bottomless pit. Mm -hmm. So remember we have a social contract between uh, the government and the citizens. Mm -hmm. So the government can't keep on collecting money and increasing taxes, mm -hmm. but people don't know where that money is going to. So the SO is mm -hmm. where we keep on just funding, but now we have a different environment. And I think people will change how they do things, but we also need a stronger SAS. Mm -hmm. We need, while we need people to do the right thing, we need a stronger SAS. I mean, SAS. the president did announce that yes. a tax commission mm -hmm. would be set up to, you know, try to sort out some of the things that are happening there yes. at SARS, including people not wanting to pay their taxes at an administration. Mm -hmm. But those who are, you know, wanting to take advantage of lower taxes in other jurisdictions or profit shifting or, or tax as havens it's called, and all tax that. havens and all, yeah. yeah. What should they know about this budget? Because it looks like the minister came down pretty hard on them too. But you must remember that if you are a South African, you are taxed on your worldwide income. So you are not supposed to be moving income 
because in terms of what Babs is saying as well, you should not be moving tax to your sa safe heavens. They are going to deal with that. We need to close on most of those to make sure that people are doing the right things. Mm -hmm. And Tim, I mean, as an investor, you must be pretty pleased that there was nothing announced in the way of increasing the dividend withholding tax yet again. Um, I suppose, I suppose pretty much. Um, and I also don't think, I think potentially it's not that, that great a, a source of uh, tax revenue to, to, to some degree. Um, although it, it, it would have been uh, you know, an, another source of uh, another source of revenue, but it is actually quite interesting that they didn't change that one, uh, and also CGT, which is a, which is another one. Um, but yeah, those two have been left unchanged. I suppose it's it's to not uh, spook the stock market in any way. And I suppose it also goes without a say that you know the fact that we're projecting a much higher growth rates for South Africa means you know a lot of the companies that are invested on the stock market have got the opportunity to grow better to potentially you know pay shareholders more dividend as a result of uh, conducive or conducive conditions to increase profits. Uh, yeah, yeah, th th that's true. I'd um, I'd, ag I'd agree with that one, um, but at the <laughs> At, at, at the same time, I, I suppose it would have been a it, it would have actually been a, a little bit of a source of revenue had he raised that. But like you said, um, like the expected move was really the um, was really the VAT side of things. Welcome back. Now the number of ministries has grown steadily at vast cost to the taxpayer since 1994. Let's take a look at how much they've grown. One of the expenses new President Cyril Ramaphosa has vowed to cut down is the bloated cost of government ministries. The country started out at the dawn of democracy in 1994 with just under 20 ministries under Nelson Mandela. Tabombeki increased this to 26 in 1999. Then Jacob Zuma's years saw the cabinet increase to 35 ministries with 37 deputies. This costs the taxpayer a staggering 720 million rand a year, which is equivalent to $61.3 million. The opposition is calling for a major cutback in the next budget. Well, not only the opposition, the president himself has committed to reviewing the size of governments. And of course, he delivered that at the State of the Nation address just last week Thursday. This is what the people on the streets had to say about the bloated ministries. I don't think he should be uh, presenting a budget because he's a uh, Gupta stooge. I don't have confidence. I never had confidence on Malusiki Kaba and the best that he could do is to resign before he even starts his budget speech. He needs to actually step down because the person who appointed him already is no longer in, in the office. So he needs someone who can do a better job and kind of like increase the confidence. Well, I'm still joined by my studio guests as we continue to unpack the uh, budget for 2018. And perhaps let's pick up on the size of uh, government and the, uh, the the public wage bill of government as a result. We've seen it balloon under Zuma's administration. I mean, was enough mentioned in this budget about it coming down? No, I mean, I mean uh, the specifics clearly um, are, are still to be De deliberated on by the president and as he said he's not go he's going to take his time because uh, essentially it should be a restructuring right now i think you have the department of agriculture then you have the department of land rural, land and rural i mean almost four departments coming from the original department of agriculture so it's a restructuring uh, more than a reshuffle of the cabinet we need a restructuring that's how you're going to see the bloated top of the of the public sector wage bill come down but remember they do come with civil servants mm -hmm. under them and uh, you've du duplicated everything across mm -hmm. the piece so you need to look at that and the other thing that is coming up now i mean they are going to renegotiate the three-year mm -hmm. public sector wage bill the projections that come in the budget are based on what government believes inflation is going to be for the next few years you must always remember that the inflation that people feel at different uh, uh, spectrum of the income levels is, is different. It might be that they feel that for them, inflation actually feels higher than the 5.3% we've realized in 2017. So that is a potential curveball if not handled carefully. 
the restructuring of, of, of the ministry is going to, ministry is going to take time. Hopefully, when you go to the medium term budget later in the year, that will already have been done. Um, but I think let's watch out and see what the public sector wage negotiations look like, because that is also bloated. And I mean, if when you blow the, <laughs> the cabinet, you bloat the public sector. Mm, mm. And the sad thing about South Africa is that I think government now becomes the employer of the last resort. Mm. Government's job is not to employ as many people as possible. It should be the private sector. But because there isn't enough happening in the private sector, you see part of that's part of the result. And that's also part of why the social grants have to increase, because you're not creating jobs to absorb enough people in the economy. Mm -hmm. Mm. It's going to take time, it's but it's also not going to be very popular and it's also going to be very difficult. I mean, you can imagine what uh, Kosatu and the South African Communist Party already are saying about the increase in the VAT rate. Yes. I mean, how do you think they're going to feel about possibly getting, you know, lower than a f inflation or even a freeze in, in salary increases? Yeah, that's, that, that's going to be very, very interesting because like, I think we are affected in different ways. But then they have to come to the party because we're doing this for the country, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. Because when we talk about uh, government spending as well, because for me, he's saying, and if I understand him correctly, he's saying I will reduce government spending by 85 billion over three years. So it's not only the wage bill, I think they're talking about everything else, like the contracts, how they can efficiently do certain things. And that's what we have been really asking for, to say, why do you have so many people and what exactly are they doing? So can we reassess the current state and say there are activities that are not value adding? I mean, you look at the private sector, when we talk about cutting costs, what are we talking about? We're talking about reducing the kind of things that we are doing that are not value adding. And we talk about doing more with less, mm -hmm. you know? So the, we the work ethic as well of government people has to change. They need to actually be serious about what they are doing. And we need to know what they are doing. We can't have five people doing the same thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Or you have five people who are dressing up and getting to the office and they don't know what they're doing there. You know, there is no value add at all. So Kosatu has to come to the party as well. The problem, I suppose, is how do you do that without ensuring that those people also don't, uh, you know, end up falling into this unemployment line? But we'll come back to that point. I just want to get Tim in here. I mean, uh, Tim, uh, we're talking about the private sector's role and the public sector's role here, and that for the longest of time, the public sector has been the uh, one to create all the jobs and been the one to, you know, employ all the people. And this is not necessarily its responsibility. My question to you, I mean, this budget, is it as in, in investor and business friendly as possible to encourage the, the, the private sector to once again take on that role of being a, a creator of jobs? Um, I'm not sure to what extent it, uh, it will change the status quo. I mean, there's a lot of focus in terms of, um, uh, you know, sort of supporting small businesses, uh, sort of changing the competition structure of uh, of, of the South African economy in terms of the competitive landscape, because South Africa does tend to be quite, um, uh, uh, how, how best I put it, it, South Africa does tend to be quite, uh, the, the business environment is skewed a lot more to larger companies. But the one, in, the one issue with it is that a lot of the interventions are ultimately backed again by government. So if government is not employing civil servants, it's uh, involved in, uh, you know, sort of startup programs for 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 small companies, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of uh, you know, one of the comments I often make to people is, you know, if a young 25 year old wants to build a company like, say, the size of I don't know, a, dim a dimension data, um, how many people look at doing that outside of um, something that involves support from the state? And there's not a lot of um, uh, th there's not a lot of scope for that, which tends to be very worrying because ultimately, at the end of the day you end up with a situation where most avenues come back to the state, whether it's your social grant, whether it's um, uh, running internships and yeah. youth development training, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ultimately, a lot of it always leads back to, to, to the government. So you end up with, a, with an issue where, you know, essentially you've, you've got party capture in a very subtle form, you know, almost a bit like you take them after 30 over many years, you find out that your country is actually run by the army.
<laughs> no, for sure. But Tim, I mean, he also mentioned uh, some severe action that would be taken against, you know, state entities that didn't pay people on time. I mean, surely such punitive talk uh, would encourage the private sector slightly to maybe look at government as a, as a, as a client or an increased client once again. Um, it, it may or may not be. I, th I, th I think a lot of people who operate in that space, if you know, if, if, if you want to support um, or if you want to supply services to government, a lot of uh, people are, who, who do that are quite used to some of the the the, the payment problems. Um, I, I, I think from a very much on the on, on the ground perspective, I don't think a lot of uh, policymakers actually realise how difficult it is to actually be a small business in South Africa, because the easiest way to fund a company is just to pay your creditors late. Um, and that tends to be fairly popular here. And, and I think to change the mindset is, uh, is, is quite difficult and would require a fair amount of work. Um, I think on the state-owned enterprises thing, it's more important just to get, um, uh, you know, just to get them running more uh, or, or losing a lot less money, for example, SAA, you know, and how much gets get spent in, in, in subsidizing SAA. Mm. Well, there is new management there at SAA. I suppose we need to give them a little bit of a chance to see if they can turn things around. Lucia, coming back to you. I mean, you you know, you review the size of all these departments that have amassed over the years, but uh, what do you do with these people? We need to, I think we're going to have to take some pain because the reality is that some people are going to be without jobs. But if we are growing the economy in the right way, we should have more entrepreneurs. We need to talk about creating more entrepreneurs, even coming from the universities, instead of finding people who, I am now done, I need to go find a job. So we need more of that. But then when you look at the departments, the first thing you do is you freeze all the uh, open positions that you have. You reallocate your people to more uh, value-adding uh, activities. and you're going to have to have the tough conversation. I mean, if it happens in the private sector, unfortunately, it is, it's going to have to happen in the, pri in the public sector as well. Mm. I mean, but talking but about... Okay. Continue. It will, in the medium term, actually increase unemployment rates. But if we give more people, like, you know, opportunities to be entrepreneurs and whatever, we are going to be able to counter that. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, for sure, and uh, the budget looks like it wants to create more entrepreneurs. It's looking at a, 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 a fund for small businesses of 2.1 billion rand to start mm -hmm. to help those start up at the start, uh, starting phase. Uh, do you think this will be enough? So for me, it's going to be a combination of things. Yes, that is a, is a good start. You, we haven't talked about the the biggest um, shake up from the SONA and in the budget as well, the land expropriation. Sure. What for me matters is, even if you qualify for that part of that fund that is set up, what are you going to do about it? Somebody who has the talent and the ability to run a small business, not all of us. Some of us are going to be employees in big companies. There are a lot of those. We need to get that talent and get that model right. You also need to get the model for land expropriation right as well. You don't want to give land to people to rent out so that people can build houses or do other things. The president actually mentioned that you need to protect food security. Importantly, you need to invest in people who have been proven to be able to do it so that you can add to the GDP of the country. Mm -hmm. He touted agriculture as a contributor to the last quarter as GDP growth. You need for that to continue. So you need to get people who are going to farm the land and farm them commercially and productively. It doesn't mean that if you are a small farmer or a small entrepreneur, you can keep on depending. So you don't want to move the dependency from state-owned enterprises to small businesses who are going to continue pumping money without actually seeing something come out of that. You want them to be yeah, they're labor intensive in nature. You want them to create employment. You also want them to be standalone business. You, you fund them for a number of years. They, they stand on their own and they can compete mm -hmm. on their own in the economy. That's how you're going to grow the economy. Not by just saying that you've got 18 new people on paper without them showing a turnaround 
in terms of how the business operates. No, for sure. But in terms of growing the economy, I mean, he kept on hampering about how, you know, we need to grow it inclusively. And ultimately, it needs to, we need to take a radical approach to mm. uh, grow it inclusively. Mm. But uh, this budget didn't seem that radical, though. Or was it just me? Lucia? It wasn't that radical. But then, remember, we were comparing it to what happened in October for the medium term budget speech. So it, it, it moved. It gave us some, you know, something to work with at least. But I wouldn't say it was that radical at all. Mm -hmm. mm. I mean, Tim, when, when, when you look at this, I mean, uh, as an investor who has um, really enjoyed the gains that Cyril Ramaphosa has brought to the currency uh, so far without really having said or uh, done much, when you look at this uh, budget, I suppose it reinforces the hand that the uh, president now has had. And I I'm curious, do you think that um, Gigaba would have delivered uh, a similar budget had we not seen a change in, in leadership that we did in the past couple of days? Um, I, th I think to a large extent the, the budget is probably wouldn't have changed that much. I, f I forget the exact timeline, but uh, apparently preparation of a budget takes a, a fair amount of time. I think the, the, the what we're seeing a lot in, in terms of the move in bond yields, uh, the JSC uh, has responded very positively to the budget today. Uh, you know, the RAND is stronger. Is is there actually going to be, well, to what degree is there going to be follow through and delivery on on the various promises, because at the moment I think what we're basically seeing is a lot of uh, is a lot of post Zuma optimism. And then one of the things that, um, uh, that I think people should be wary of is uh, the effectiveness of some of the the, the programs. And you know, it, it's it's all very well to talk about how much money you're going to be dishing out. Uh, for example, uh, I was just looking up some numbers. Uh, Chile has got a startup program. Their one is a little bit different because they encourage entrepreneurs from around the world to go to Chile and, and start up jobs. Um, the 2.1 billion that you mentioned earlier works out to about 175 million. Uh, startup Chile, I think, has run on about 40 million and created 200,000 jobs, apparently, uh, based on you know statistics on the internet. So there also is that question of, you know, at the end of the day, is is that two and a half? Sorry, is that 2.1 billion basically going to end up being, for example, um, you know, very cynically, uh, being directed largely towards people who are ANC Youth League members, for example? Welcome back. The last making state-owned enterprises were at the top of the list when Finance Minister Malusi Gigaba went into a pre-budget lockup in Pretoria. Let's get a taste of what he had to say. The state-owned enterprises of South Africa cost the taxpayer more and more. In 2016-17 alone, the six largest state-owned companies borrowed $98.1 to stay afloat. No more, says the Finance Ministry. State-owned companies are expected to fund their own operation. It's not fair for taxpayers' money to be used for continual bailouts caused by operational inefficiency and financial mismanagement says Malusi Gagaba, finance minister, in the pre-budget lockup in Pretoria. The government says it has come up with a turnaround plan. Part of it is to sell off 195,000 government-owned properties worth an estimated 40 billion rand. Well, Finance Minister Malusi Gigaba also outlined South Africa's financial risks as he spoke to journalists in the pre-budget lockup in Pretoria. Let's also take a look. Political and policy certainty is at the top of the list of risks, followed by public service wage agreement. The public service wage agreement for hundreds of thousands of civil servants is this year. If this is above inflation, it could be a problem. ESCOM and the state-owned enterprises. The financial situation at ESCOM and the other state-owned enterprises is a big risk. Free education. Uncertainty over how free higher education will be paid for. Another downgrade could see South Africa excluded from the City World Government Bond Index, triggering a sell-off of South African debt. Well, after years of stagnation, South Africa's growth appears to be recovering. Finance Minister Malusi Gigaba talked of better times ahead when he briefed a journalist earlier today. South Africa's ailing economy has taken a slight turn for the better, according to the Finance Minister. GDP growth was expected to be 0.7% in October. Now the GDP growth for 2017 is expected to be 1%. 
The South African economy is expected to rise to 1.5 percent growth in 2018 and increase to 2.1 percent in 2020. South Africa needs to be bold and coordinated in building sectors where we have comparative advantage and can be truly world class. These include, but are not limited to, mining, agriculture, tourism, as well as manufacturing and service exports, says Gigaba, the finance minister. The cost of this low growth has been private investment is down and unemployment is at 26.7 percent. Well, of course, I'm still joined by Lucia Shongwana, who's EY Africa tax leader, Tendani Manchimuli, who's a CFO, Group IT Finance at Liberty, and Tim Namo, founder at Ironhead Trading. I mean, let's just get back to dissecting a very, very long budget. We'll do the best that we can. Okay, Tendani, mining charter. He did touch on that, the impasse uh, between the government and the mining companies. Looking like it's going to be better, but that's as a result of... Of, uh, Ramaphosa. Yes. So, so for me, that's that's that's. I'm trying to build a case for maybe a better. On the clip, we just saw something about better times ahead in terms of the economy. Mm -hmm. So the first one for me is part of why the mining sector is not investing is the uncertainty caused by the mining charter. Mm -hmm. If you unlock that and you unlock investment expansion in the mining sector, that goes a long way towards boosting employment. Remember mining is one or has been one of the largest employers mm -hmm. in the past. They have retrenched a lot, partly because of the strikes and partly also because of the uncertainty by management. Where are we going as a mining industry? Foreign investors uh, fled from investing in the mining sector. So if that is unlocked, and I mean it seems they were encouraging talks over the weekend uh, with the president with the case that was supposed to go in on Monday postponed so that the parties can find each other. If you unlock that and mining um, uh, comes back to the potential and not the sunset industry, as the president said, and become a sunrise industry, I think that's, that's very good uh, potential there for employment creation and also boosting economic growth. All right, so let's just leave it there for yes. a second. We are going to uh, Parliament right now on the ground there in Cape Town where uh, CNBC Africa's Garabola Tatla is standing by. Garabo, reaction from or for the budget on the ground in Cape Town. Take us through that. Well, Fifi, thank you very much for coming to us right here on the steps of Parliament. Joining me right now is the Minister of Trade and Industry, Mr. Rob Davis. So, for your time, I thank you. Let's begin with um, your roots as a, as a trade unionist. Uh, is this a budget that is pro-poor? Well, I think it's a budget that has had to be adopted in very, very difficult financial uh, circumstances, fiscal circumstances. They were outlined in considerable detail and frankness by the minister in October last year. But uh, I think that a number of the interventions that are there are intended to be exactly that. Uh, so first of all, the, the big new uh, spending is on higher education and training, particularly uh, greater access to the poor. Uh, this is uh, extremely timely because uh, we are in the midst of this uh, thing called the fourth industrial revolution. It means that the premium is on people who've got skills and uh, post-school education. And if you don't have it, it's much harder to get into any kind of productive uh, activity, be a worker at a factory, and many uh, of the service sectors, and even to be an entrepreneur. So I think that all of that is, is, is positive. And then uh, there were a number of uh, policy tools around industrialization uh, that uh, will continue to be funded even though the budget is tight. Minister, part of South Africa's problem is not, of course, the policies and the plans which have been there. It's been really the implementation for, for you know, the tar to meet the, the rubber and for something to get going here. Did he push the envelope enough with regards to manufacturing? Is there enough incentives to make manufacturers come here and create the much needed jobs? Well, I think that there, there, is in, there are the incentives in place. Uh, of course, if we had more, we could do more. But I think what's also very, very important was that he talked about uh, the procurement rules and uh, greater consequence management. This has been something that's been very close to our heart because localization has been uh, a, a decision of government translated in a number of cases 
into practice notes by National Treasury and then flouted by a number of public entities who have not respected those and very often contracts and tenders which have been problematic uh, in the context of corruption state capture, many of those have actually been for the procurement of imports rather than locally manufactured project products. So I think that the, the way he announced that they, they're going to tighten up, we're already working with the Auditor General to tighten up as well. Uh, I think that could make that policy tool a lot more effective. It's not on the budget, but it's a policy tool uh, that uh, we can deploy and need to deploy so we have a much stronger uh, purchase of locally manufactured products. He also spoke about 100 billion rand that's been allocated towards the, the Black Industrialist Program. We've been hearing a lot about that program. Is the program well and ready to actually deliver not just on the number of black industrialists, but on the beneficiaries of such businesses? Well, I, I, I wish he had said 100 billion. He didn't say anything <laughs> like that. Uh, but um, uh, what, we, what we have done uh, in terms of the incentive program we run by the DTI, which, by the way, has been completely reprioritization. We haven't got any additional funding for it is we have at this, at this point in time, we've supported uh, 72 uh, black industrialists, uh, and we will be reaching the target of 100 by the end of this financial year, I'm convinced of that. Uh, what we will have to be doing now is to set ourselves a new target, which will allow new entrants, but also to look at some of those existing ones, and how do we take them yet a step further forward, so that they become not just uh, uh, small players, but they actually become much more significant uh, um, members uh, of our industrial uh, uh, family. So I think that's uh, something that we'll be looking at uh, in the future. And, and of course, uh, he, he did identify the importance of the Black Industrialist Program. Minister, part of South Africa's problem has been creation of jobs. For far too long, we've been saying the same mantra, jobs, jobs, jobs. How is this budget going to aid in the securing of these jobs? Well, I think that um, what it does is it uh, addresses the, the fiscal challenges in a way which I think will build on what the President uh, uh, really managed to achieve in the SONA, uh, which is to, to set the tone for a more positive at the, at the attitude to buy investors, domestic and foreign. Uh, and uh, I've seen that palpably even in uh, one of the auto companies I went to visit uh, the, the, the day after the SONA. And I think that uh, all of that uh, indicates that uh, we are, uh, I think, in, in, a, in a space uh, in which uh, the, the, the mood is more positive. If we can build on that with concrete programs, I think we can uh, achieve a high level of investment. High level of investment turns into a high level of economic opportunity, uh, and that uh, translates into more jobs. That's what we need to do. Minister, it's estimated that we lost about a trillion rand worth of investments in the nine years of the Jacob Zuma presidency. That's just the estimates. My, my concern is that right now what we're seeing is a market that is putting its hope on the new South African uh, authority at the top, a market that celebrated today's budget really as pragmatic. We saw the rand, if you will, gain a bit after the minister got onto the podium and started speaking. How do you make sure that we will seize this opportunity and not just speak about it as a wasted one like the past nine years? Well, I, I'm not sure that we lost a trillion rand of investments. I don't know where those uh, figures come from. Uh, but uh, in the past, uh, let's say, two or three years, for sure, uh, we had been performing suboptimally in terms of investment. Uh, what uh, people were saying was that there was a low level of investor confidence. I think we knew that. Uh, much as uh, we were still working with investors and still getting investment to happen. But I think that uh, what has changed now is that even it was palpably obvious in Davos, uh, where people are beginning to see South Africa has been performing below potential, has been performing below its peers, uh, and I think that are beginning to say, well, there's opportunities here because uh, now uh, some of the issues that have kept us away are being addressed, uh, and that uh, that on its own should uh, should give us a, a, a new uh, opportunity. But it's not a, not sufficient. We've actually got to make sure that our programs work better and that we uh, concretely ensure that, for example, our incentives are deployed in a, in a way that we get value for money, that uh, we our tools like localization are in place, that we run uh, an efficient uh, one-stop shop for investors, uh, and that we address all the other issues in the economy uh, to make this uh, a more conducive environment. Minister, you've doubted my, my effects and which made me think about something which is a, a very unaligned. Government comes out and the minister says we're expecting this year 1.5% oh, growth. 
people I speak to, like Goldman Sachs, are, exper are expecting 2 2.5 percent. Investec is expecting 2 percent. Why aren't these numbers and growth expectations not aligned, or are you undershooting so you can over deliver? No, I think that the, the minister explained it uh, in the budget. He said that the uh, 1 percent uh, plus is the floor. Uh, and uh, quite often in the presentations the Treasury does, they say this is, this is it, this is like the basic. Uh, if we put the SOCs right, then we add a, a certain amount. If we uh, make sure that some of the industrial policy tools work better, we add to it. Uh, if we get the mining uh, issues and certainty of the mining sector right, uh, we add to it again. Uh, and then we, we, we start to get to some of the numbers that the others are, 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 are giving us. And maybe some of those are already factoring those, uh, those things in. But I think uh, what we need to do is say to ourselves, uh, the things that have to happen uh, in order to, to move the growth uh, rate higher. Minister, it's your responsibility as part of your department to really warn government of the threats or the opportunities posed by the fourth industrial revolution. This budget, how do you feel it addressed those challenges and those opportunities? Well, I think the first point was, as I already said, that the investment in higher education and training is, is, is quite fundamental. Uh, if we don't do it, uh, and we have a, a large number of people, young people in particular, who don't have skills. Uh, we're going to have a, 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 an even worse unemployment problem because I think all of the jobs that are going to be created now uh, with the fourth industrial revolution are going to be for people who've got post-secondary education, literacy in, in ICT and stuff like that. So uh, I think that's the first point. The second point I would say is that we, 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 we need to... Uh, understand that the adoption of uh, digital technology is going to be an element of competitiveness. Mm -hmm. We need to embrace those technologies where they can uh, provide uh, creative developmental solutions, uh, opportunities for entrepreneurship, uh, and solve some of our problems like uh, delivery of services. But at the same time, I think we need to be well aware that there's a potential to widen inequalities, uh, to reshore industries back to uh, countries with uh, uh, where there's high levels of consumption and stuff like that. And I think that there's a, there's a huge agenda there. We've got to grapple with, uh, with, with this. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, we are working on this, I can say. Uh, we've got a, 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 it's an aspect of our work on the Industrial Policy Action Plan. And we've got a number of proposals which we will be uh, tabling in due course. Minister, I thank you for your thank time. You. Thank, thank you, you. Very much. That was Minister Rob Davy speaking to us just on the stairs of Parliament after hearing what he calls a socially inclined budget. As we saw, Fifi, the amount of money that government will be putting towards government programs which really look after the, the under... Uh, uh, underprivileged and rather the less fortunate amongst us. The money that's being spent on higher education alone, a whopping 57 billion, it now becomes officially the single most uh, funded item of government. For sure, Garabo, thanks so much for that. Uh, we'll be uh, coming back to you, I'm sure, as soon. But let's just uh, wrap up the uh, discussion that we've been having right now. I mean, Tindani, you talked about the mining and charter, or the mining charter, rather, how sorting that out will help, um, you know, create jobs, and how, you know, that's as a result of the fact that we've got some uh, political or policy certainty coming to the fray to the mining sector. Lucia, I mean, do you think we're got the, the the political uncertainty that's been stifling growth in this economy do you think that it's out the way now with this new leadership uh, to a large extent remember we can't have the guarantees to say it's definitely out but then this creates a lot of confidence it says we have moved like up to 90 percent so it depends also on what we see in terms of the cabinet reshuffle if we can call it that because we have to get rid of what has not been working out for us as a country. Mm -hmm. so if we do that, we will inspire more confidence. No, for sure. Mm -hmm. So Tim, this uh, possible or this looming cabinet reshuffle that many say has to happen, I suppose uh, not expecting too much of a negative impact or negative reaction from the market should it happen as soon as tomorrow? Um, I don't think the, the market would react too negatively to it unless, um, for example, a lot of the uh, members of cabinet who have viewed somewhat negatively stay. So uh, I suppose a very good sign would be if there was an element of, of, of cleaning house. Um, but I think I think going forward, uh, you know, with, with the increase in confidence, I think the main thing that uh, people will be looking for is, um, I, I think less it's about sort of uh, less about the, the overall level of where markets are, but more 
looking at just less volatility because ever since uh, the Nenegate thing, uh, you know, uh, movements, especially on something like the RAND, for example, have been have been quite marked. Um, and going forward, you know, if there's more confidence, uh, you know, you look for more for, for more stable and more predictable trajectories in terms of what the markets are going to do. So just to summarize this conversation, we heard from Johan Alts of Old Mutual and Tim also agreeing that this budget has averted a ratings downgrade. Tindani, Lucia, your views? I agree. I mean, the outlook is more positive. It shows that we do have a plan to reduce the budget deficit, and I think it's more a pragmatic budget. Lucia? I certainly agree. And remember, it is not only the budget. It is all the activities leading to this day, like last week, everything that happened last week leading to today. I think all of that are very positive things for us as a country. Well, if certainly we do have SNP uh, Global Rating. Uh, they'll be speaking to us uh, in just a bit uh, to tell us how they think uh, or they feel about this budget that's just been delivered by the uh, Finance Minister. But at this stage, I'd like to uh, thank my studio uh, guests for unpacking an extremely long, long uh, budget. I mean, uh, some are saying that it was so long and his goodbyes at the end essentially <laughs> signaled that this was a possible a goodbye as Finance Minister to his post. Only time will tell at this stage, but it is certainly goodbye right now to Lucia Shongwanu, who's the EY Africa tax leader, Tendani Manjimulu, who's the CFO of Group IT Finance at Liberty, and of course, Tim Namo, founder at Ironhead Trading.